those of you who have tuned in to see a road test of the Bentley Continental will no doubt be disappointed to learn that just two days before we were due to film it, somebody turned it into a banana-shaped Bentley. Well, you can take heart for two reasons. First, you're not as disappointed as I am. And second, we've got something just as special. If I were to give you unlimited money, what car would you buy? Ferrari, no doubt about it. A red Ferrari. It'd be a Ferrari, wouldn't it? A red sports car. I think I would buy a Ferrari. Just about everyone in the world would chop off an important limb or two if it meant they could have a Ferrari. And yet the so-called experts, the people who write about cars like this in the motoring magazines, are forever telling us that you could never live with one on a day-to-day -day basis, that its fiery Latin temperament would be all too much after a while. Well, that may be the case with the F40, but what about the 348 here? It only costs a miserable £76,000. Surely you could live with one of these every day of the week. Well, there was only one way to find out, and yet again I had to sacrifice myself in the name of this programme. I had to drive around in this for a week. People ask these days why on earth you would spend all the extra money to buy a Ferrari when for a whole lot less you could have something like a Nissan 300 ZX. They'll tell you that it's every bit as fast, that it's just as striking and that it's a whole lot easier to drive and they're right. But a Nissan 300 is not a piece of motoring folklore. I'm going to go to a party tonight, and when I'm asked what sort of car I'm running around in at the moment, and I will be, I shall say, a Ferrari. And I shall enjoy saying it almost as much as I enjoy driving it. It didn't have a catalytic converter. Now mine has got a catalytic converter. The converter. old one, the old 328, that never had a catalytic converter, so it means that can be green and fast. The lady looks fine, but unfortunately you're unsuitably dressed. Oh. I thought a Ferrari was supposed to open doors. Didn't have much luck with that one. In a morning, you'd probably expect a Ferrari to be harder to coax into life than Lazarus, or a nightclub bouncer. But with fuel injection, it's up and running the instant you turn the key. Turning the wheel is a deal harder. 
but once extricated from its overnight slot, I was off for another day of soaking up the admiring glances, snarling past people at 30 miles an hour in a car that can top 160. Daft? Yes, of course, but surely only as daft as buying a four-seater and then spending 90% of the time all on your own in it. You could certainly never accuse the 348 of wasting space. Now, I fit just fine, but Yuletide foliage? Well, that's another story. Hmm. Ah. Squeezing things into a Ferrari, then, is hard work. But squeezing the Ferrari through things is not as hard as you might imagine. The visibility is good, but from time to time, I did wish other drivers would give it a wider berth. Mainly because, if it had been damaged, someone would have come and taken it away. I'm not going to pretend that a Ferrari is easy to drive. This is not heavy. This is my clutch. Same goes for the steering. And the gearbox can be a bit recalcitrant first thing in the morning. So no, the Ferrari is a pain when you're in a traffic jam. But all cars are a pain when you're in a traffic jam. The difference is, in a Ferrari, you can at least dream of the day when absolutely nothing else would do. Imagine a spot of bungee jumping in your coffee break or... How about a bit of fly fishing over lunch? Because if you get tedious leisure pursuits like that out of the way in the working week, it leaves the weekend free for some real fun. Quad biking, wet biking, skiing, horseback riding, you name it. You might even find some time to shoot something for the Sunday roast. It's all nonsense, of course. It's a world dreamt up by blue-spectacled advertising copywriters who want to sell us things. Anyway, having tried to convince us that we must all do leisure at every given opportunity, they're now trying to sell us cars to do it in. The idea is, of course, that we can't go wet biking or hang gliding or even shopping in Knightsbridge without an all-terrain vehicle. And they're obviously having some success because sales of these things are going through the roof. And now there's a new kid in town, never mind the roof, they'll be going through the ozone layer as well. Let's just say, for the sake of argument, that you're the chairman of General Motors, Hank J. Dieselberger III of Detroit, Michigan. You own 37% of Isuzu, which makes a small Jeep just like this, called the Amigo. You also own all of Vauxhall, which desperately wants a small Jeep to cash in on a huge demand for them in Europe. So you introduce Mr. Okinawa of Isuzu to Mr. Fotherington Sorbet of Vauxhall, and hey presto, Isuzu increases its sales, and Vauxhall, for rather less than the price of a packet of cornflakes, gets its small Jeep, which it is making in Britain from British steel using German engines. The only Japanese bits are the dashboard and the four-wheel drive system. As a neat finishing touch, it's being sold here not as an Isuzu, but as the Vauxhall Frontera Sport. Now, before you rush off to make supper, thinking I'm about to start talking about Range Rover money, I think it's important to stress right now that this rather butch-looking machine is yours, for just £12,250. Why so cheap? Well, to find out, you have to scratch beneath the surface. Superficially, at least, the interior all seems to be very well trimmed. I've got tasteful upholstery and a good thick leather wheel here. OK, some of the switch gear's a bit daft. These light buttons are very difficult to find at night, but you can live with that. What you can't live with quite so easily is that all the choice little toys, the electrically adjustable heated door mirrors, the electric windows, the central locking and so on, are all expensive extras. It rather looks as though the original item was designed by someone who took his inspiration from old Mother Hubbard's cupboard. And then there's the underneath. Now, the rear end is suspended not on coil springs, as you might imagine, but on sort of rickshaw technology that looks like it's come off a piece of farm machinery. 
But do not for one moment think this is aimed at the farmer who needs something to round up his Frisians. With its garish paintwork and a two-litre engine lifted straight out of the Vauxhall Cavalier, it's aimed instead at the person who is fed up with paying through the nose to ensure a hot hatchback. If you are used to a hot hatchback, you'll find the Frontera, well, how can it be tactful? A bit slow. 0 to 60 takes a pedestrian 12 seconds and top speed is noisy. Furthermore, it isn't all that sparing with the jungle juice, using a gallon of unleaded every 25 miles or so. Now, these figures may well disappoint those coming to it from, say, an Astra GTE, but as far as Jeeps go, they're not half bad. The same applies with the ride and handling. Those used to conventional hatchbacks will find the Frontera bouncy and wallowy, but those coming to it from, say, a Suzuki Vitara or a Daihatsu Sport Track should, I think, be pleasantly surprised. It is, however, very easy to drive. You've got power steering, a light gearbox, and a good view thanks to this high seating position. Even your granny could handle this, no problem at all. Statistics show that 80% of people who buy so-called small Jeeps never ever take them off-road. This means they're putting up with all the disadvantages without ever utilising the one big advantage. It's a bit like buying a Lamborghini Diablo and refusing to take it out of first gear. I know that if I had a Frontera, I'd never be able to resist the temptation just once in a while to ease it into four-wheel drive and go yomping. Vauxhall have produced a booklet all about driving responsibly in the countryside. Unfortunately, I never read it. Now, I'm not going to be daft and say it doesn't have the off-road ability of a Range Rover, because of course it doesn't. It only costs a third as much. But if you are one of the leisure generation and you really do go bungee jumping in your coffee break, it will get to places that your average hot hatch couldn't. What's more, it will get there no matter what the weather is doing. You'll also be able to get a lot of people in here. There's space in the front for a couple of prop forwards, and in the back, unlike most Jeeps of this type, there really is space for a couple of people. Now, these figures may well disappoint those coming to it from, say, an Astra GTE, but as far as Jeeps go, they're not half bad. The same applies with the ride and handling. Those used to conventional hatchbacks will find the Frontera bouncy and wallowy, but those coming to it from, say, a Suzuki Vitara or a Daihatsu Sport Track should, I think, be pleasantly surprised. It is, however, very easy to drive. You've got power steering, a light gearbox, and a good view thanks to this high seating position. Even your granny could handle this, no problem at all. Statistics show that 80% of people who buy so-called small Jeeps never ever take them off-road. This means they're putting up with all the disadvantages without ever utilising the one big advantage. It's a bit like buying a Lamborghini Diablo and refusing to take it out of first gear. I know that if I had a Frontera, I'd never be able to resist the temptation just once in a while to ease it into four-wheel drive and go yomping.
Vauxhall have produced a booklet all about driving responsibly in the countryside. Unfortunately, I never read it. Now, I'm not going to be daft and say it doesn't have the off-road ability of a Range Rover, because of course it doesn't. It only costs a third as much. But if you are one of the leisure generation and you really do go bungee jumping in your coffee break, it will get to places that your average hot hatch couldn't. What's more, it will get there no matter what the weather is doing. You'll also be able to get a lot of people in here. The space in the front for a couple of prop forwards. And in the back, unlike most Jeeps of this type, there really is space for a couple of people, especially if you take the roof off. However, there is one problem. The boot. It's so small, just about the only piece of leisure equipment you can get inside is a pair of wellies. Now, to counter this criticism, Vauxhall is also marketing a five-door estate version. But it, too, has problems with the boot, or rather the tailgate. The problem is, to open it, even enough to get your shopping in, you have to move this substantial piece of ironmongery out of the way, which is a problem if someone's parked up close behind you. Still, once done, split folding a fair like on a Range Rover, and there's enough space in there very nearly to get a quad bike. Other problems? Well, not quite as stylish as the Sport, and uh, if you go for the diesel version that we've got here, your neighbours won't think you're the funniest person in the world when you start it up in the morning. Big noise. As far as the Frontera Sport is concerned, I liked its looks, its terrific value for money, and with 580 dealers, spare parts aren't exactly hard to come by. It is burdened, however, with a lumpy ride, wonky switches, and a tiny boot. Ford constantly monitors the amount of steering lock I apply, how much grip is available and how fast I'm going. If it decides I'm going too fast, a large boxing glove springs out of the steering wheel and punches me in the face. No, I'm only kidding. What actually happens is it throttles back. It decides how fast I go around a corner. I don't. Disengage the system and cornering is a wild experience as the tyres scrabble to overcome my youthful exuberance. But when the system is on, even with my foot hard down in second gear, cornering is relaxed and safe, much to the relief of oncoming traffic. It's the same deal when setting off on a slippery surface. With the traction control turned off, there's lots of noise and fuss. But when it's on, after a brief flurry while the computer sorts itself out, the car sets off as though it's on a perfectly dry road. Now, all this stuff undoubtedly makes the Sigma a very safe proposition in difficult conditions. But what about the 364 days a year when it isn't snowy? The engine's pretty good. It pulls with not a hint of roughness, and top speed, for the record, is 140 miles an hour. And yes, it does have a catalytic converter. However, it's not a fun car to drive, not like a BMW, anyway. The steering is just too vague, and I'm still not convinced that 200 horsepower and front-wheel drive make desperately happy bedfellows, trace control or no. Two questions remain. Why does it look like an old NSU R080? And who on earth called it Stigma? Sorry, Sigma. <laughs> this could be Britain's newest sport. We know that everyone in this country is football crazy and they like motorsport. Well, this is a mixture of the two. It's football without muddy boots, motorsport without tyre squeal. Invented in the north of England, like all good things, it's motorised football, called motorball. The vehicles used in motorball look a bit like overgrown dodgem cars or even small hovercraft. But they're ingeniously designed, simple to operate and really quite unique. Well, these are the innards of this splendid contraption. Chris, you designed it. How does it work? Well, it's a hydraulic drive system, which are controlled by these two levers. 
push them forward and the machine goes forward, push them back, it goes back, one forward, one back, and the machine spins around in circles. And what about the power unit? It's a five horsepower, four stroke Kubota industrial engine, which is directly coupled onto the hydraulic pump, which powers the system. And how many miles per gallon do they do? Oh, I don't know about that, but it uses about one pint an hour. Right, now's the big moment, the big match, the Top Gear team are going to take on you and your troop. rubber balls are used and these are made of the same polypropylene type material as the bumpers on the cars. So let's have a look at the Top Gear team. I've been recruited as referee and linesman. Tiffany Dell up front complaining as usual. And what's this? Quentin Wilson inventing rules as he goes along. The experienced Goffey. He's covering for six foot four Clarkson and this is Janet Truin looking positively menacing here. Ball's thrown in, Mrs. Wilson, Nidal stops it. An unconventional way of scoring a goal and against the spirit of the game. Clarkson again, his hands again. That'll be disallowed, but it's a goal. The manufacturer's team now have control of the ball. But here's a surprise, it's a substitution. The young striker, Nicky Fox, replacing Chris Goffey. Right, let's go. There are a few rules in motorball, and it's a complete free-for-all here in the old Clapham bus garage. Now normally used by Playscape as an indoor cart circuit. But getting out of the car is strictly forbidden. Football crazy, he's football mad. The football it has taken away the resentment he had. And the gas from the Clapham bus garage. Oh, oh you've got to be to showcase. That means I can have a go. Just familiarise myself with the controls first. Oops. Motorball is an ingenious idea, and it's already catching on with the paying public queuing up to have a go. It's all fantastic fun, but don't take it seriously. It's absolute chaos out here on the field. I don't know what the score is. I'm told it's 6-all. <laughs> <laughs> 